there's data in, in, within the book which we pulled on before all the wars that happened within the 20th century. These shining beings appeared 10 years before the outbreak of all major battles. Across the planet, the data is there, you know, that's where I was pulling that data from. It's owned by the church. And I went down through it and I was able to see, and the majority of those beings that appeared on, in, or above rock foundations were appearing in negative magnetic anomalies, which are places that we tend to see that the 75% of the world's top suicide locations also appear in negative anomalies. It was a place that attracted blood worship. Welcome back. I'm here again with Barry Fitzgerald. Barry, welcome back. Sean, thank you very much. I enjoyed it the last time. Yeah, I did too. I hated to cut it off, but I want to make sure I use your time wisely and and able to get a second episode for everybody. So we were, I think, about to talk about the deceptions of gods and men. Mm. Can you say more about that? Yeah, uh, The Deceptions of Gods and Men was a book that was released back in March 23, I think it was. And that book itself was designed to draw our focus to what we're actually communicating with within the fields of ufology, cryptozoology, and the paranormal as a whole, even through the esoteric fields. And it was about getting us to to make that slight shift in our paradigm to let's not accept the first thing that comes along. Let's take it back a step. Let's analyze it. Let's see what it's doing. Because there's one thing that the phenomena does not want. It does not want you to sit back and study it. Because it wants you to swallow the pill. It wants you to accept the first thing that it says. If you do not accept that, it's gone. Um, And we even have accounts of that within the Bible as well, um, in which if you do not accept what I am telling you, I'm gone. I'm out of here. And uh, we really should be challenging what is coming along. And I think that in itself is very, very clear when we understand how our bodies react in those moments that the phenomena begins to manifest. And when I say it begins to manifest, I mean when it begins to appear. Because there are certain different fields in which it will operate in until it reaches that manifestation stage. And if it's manifesting, it's not an accident. It's manifesting because you're there to serve a purpose. And that purpose should be completely understood. And you see, for us, when we walk into, let's say, real estate agents, you know, they'll talk about houses, 75% of houses are sold on feeling. Well, what is that feeling? When we walk into a place, you know, we'll walk into a house, white walls, nothing to give anything away of its history or anything like that. And we walk in, we go, oh, no, no, I I just don't like this place. And you leave. You don't put in a bid because you didn't like what you felt. Yeah. Walk into another place, again, white walls. Yeah, I like this. It's it's good. It feels good. Like, what's that feeling? And... That feeling is part of the biofeedback process. This is where we start to get into our gift of discernment, our inner voice, if you like. And to understand that and how the body reacts to that is very, very important because we have a very short window between what's being said here and what's appearing out here. That is 20 seconds. I call it the 20 second window. And what tends to happen is that when an element within our system detects this phenomenon, we will either be left alone, it'll be fine, the, it's, it's, everything's okay, and we don't react to it at all, or the hair will start to go up on our arms, it'll start to go up in the back of our necks. That moment is the one that we should be listening to. Because that is our gift of discernment, telling us, get ready to move. When the United States and China clash, the world will never be the same, especially when forces beyond reality threaten to intervene. What if the United States went to war with the People's Republic of China? 
How would these rivals fight for supremacy on land, sea, air, and across the stochastic streams of time? What wonder weapons would be unleashed? What horrors would emerge from the irradiated sludge of the South China Sea? What heroes would rise and forever change the course of history? Tread into the deepest and darkest dimensions of the multiverse, gaze through a kaleidoscope of fractured realities, and bear witness to the disturbing visions of World War III from today's greatest minds in science fiction, fantasy, and horror. Weird World War, China. Available now from Bain Books at Bain.com. There is another one here. So when we're walking into a property, a haunted house or whatever, say for want of something else, if we walk into a haunted house and suddenly the hair stands up in the back of our neck, that's our warning signal. That's our gift of discernment saying, get the hell out of here. And that's very, very important. If we decide to stay and don't understand the threat, what tends to happen is that after 20 seconds, the rhythm of the brain starts to shift and moves into a theta rhythm. And that is where we tend to get fluff. That's where we tend to get the, the lies. That's where we tend to get the deception happening and things like that, because we didn't listen to that initial 20 second warning. And what tends to happen there is if we move this that same situation from a haunted house into an encounter on a highway in which someone's driving along and suddenly a, a bright white light drops in front of their car and then before you know it, there's a grey alien at their window. That particular presence, when that happens, that has not operated at a way in which we should have been listening and reacted to because the same thing will happen there. Now, if you have an encounter as a child and you have various other encounters that happen subsequently after that, that 22nd is already switched off. Mm. So as an adult, we can have our encounters in the freeway with this light and everything else. And because it was already overridden, that priming, that programming is already there. So we can't react to it. And um, so that's where it becomes exceptionally deceptive. I'll give you an example on where we can see other clues within this 20 second rule up here. And there was a, a lady in Scotland I spoke to. Uh, she was giving a, a lecture one particular day and I was attending and she said that uh, she had this encounter on top of a, a block of apartments and she was the upper floor. She woke up and all of a sudden there was this alien was standing in her bedroom and she was uh, pinned to the bed. She couldn't move. And she said, oh, it's absolutely fine. It was wonderful. I had a great experience. And they told me this and they told me that. And usually it's about the world being destroyed and we need to look after the planet. And we have to look at all that BS that they talk about, all this transgression that humanity and everything does. So, and she laughed it off. She said, it was just a wonderful experience. It was fine. And, you know, whenever I came out of it, my cat that had been sitting on the bed, it had wet the bed. And she thought this was hilarious. But I said, wait a minute. There's a clue to your 20-second rule. Your cat was afraid. I said, you should have been afraid. That cat was your raw instinct displaying itself in that it was afraid of the situation. It should have been afraid of what was coming through. And this deceptive nature we see time and time again. One really good one that we see plays itself out in Lourdes over in France. And back in the day, we had this young girl. This is like, like Our Lady of Lourdes, right? Our Lady of Lourdes. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Even yeah, yeah. the Bledsoe case is kind of yeah, similar. Yeah. And Bernadette, of course, had this encounter of a being that came out of the cave, came out of the rocks. We tend to see this phenomenon appear over, in, or around rocks, a rock plateau, even in the United States. Some wonderful research there done by David Politis on Missing 411 mm -hmm. has described a huge amount of people who, who mysteriously vanish, uh, especially within the National Park Service or the National Parks. And he was on record by saying that a huge amount of the people disappear in bolder fields. So again, we're back to the rocks, but back to France, back to Lourdes. And this image 
this woman appeared in front of Bernadette. And Bernadette was very religious. Back in the day, you know, they, they, they tended to be. And she described what this being was uh, and all the rest. Church rolled in. It was taken completely out of context and rolled into something else. And before you know it, carvings of Our Lady was being carved out. And Bernadette herself had seen the carvings. She said, this is her words. What is that? Because that is not what I saw. And in her very diary at the very beginning, Bernadette had written down at the beginning, she referred to it as not Our Lady. It wasn't the presence that she was that she should have recognized. She referred to it as that thing. To advertise on Through a Glass Darkly, email thrillglassdarkly ads at gmail.com. Those words, that thing, that told us all we needed to know of what was manifesting through the rocks. And now you've got a situation in which people are going there now and they're worshipping because that's exactly what they need. They need that worship. A lot of times it's, it's just, it flows in, flows out. You'll maybe get 20, 30 people that will worship it and then it, it fades out and disappears. Sometimes you've got the areas where it's more pronounced uh, and you tend to get that. So it's about challenging the phenomenon when it comes through. And listen, folks, I am not, by no means am I standing on any religion, any belief system. What I'm saying is, if there is something there that is there for your betterment, for your positive ends, it's not going to mind a few questions for clarity. Because you can be sure, as there's a hole in a duck's ass, the moment that you become suspicious of what you're being told and you go, eh, you do a Columbo on it, you go, eh, one more thing. It will not like that and it will clear off. And whether that be through Ouija boards or anything like that, um, if you challenge it and, it, and and it's not favorable, the answers are not favorable, you are being shown what you needed to know to the value of the communication of what you were about to venture down. So that in itself needs weighed heavily. And that's what the deception of gods and men was primarily about. It was about the idea of challenging what's coming through. There's data in, in, within the book, which we pulled on before all the wars that happened within the 20th century. These shining beings appeared 10 years before the outbreak of all major battles. Across the planet, well, the data is there, you know, the, where I was pulling that data from. It's owned by the church. And I went down through it and I was able to see. And the majority of those beings that appeared on, in, or above rock foundations were appearing in negative magnetic anomalies, which are places that we tend to see that the 75% of the world's top suicide locations also appear in negative anomalies. It was a place that attracted blood worship. So it's something that we should be aware of, that let's consider what we're calling in and know the history of what we're calling in, because there are particular beings that we will see within our modern day that we'll call in, we'll say, okay, I'm calling in, whatever. But when you go into the actual history of that particular entity that's being called in for the, better, the betterment of humanity, um, there is no history with it. So what exactly are we calling in? What's hiding behind that mask. And that can be very, very challenging. And it also changes people's paradigms. It can be a hard pill to swallow. But it's something that I feel is very important because there's an old Babylonian process, an old Babylonian esoteric process, mm -hmm. in which if your home was haunted or your business or whatever the case may be, your farm, for instance, was being plagued by a, a demon of whatever, you called in a bigger demon hmm. to take care of the lesser one. That's exactly what is happening today. That's what we see that pattern cycle after cycle after cycle occurs. So we should be very careful about what we're putting in. There are good interactions. Don't get me wrong. There are some very positive interactions, but those interactions need to be vetted. And that's very important. Very important indeed. When we talk about the phenomena 
do you see this as one broad overarching intelligence or do you see this as a collection of intelligences with different motivations and agendas much like humanity mm, mm, i see it as one the evidence is there it's clearly it's pointing at the same source we're being played as a fool and we need to be very very careful where we find ourselves especially today of all what's going on around the planet we need to be challenging what are we being told where is it coming from and what's behind it very very important because we are being played big time is it us or is it our elites or is it both <laughs> it's both it's both unfortunately at this time now you know the doors are open the horses are running and we need to see it for what it is uh, primarily and i don't know where this is going to end is there a good side <laughs> i mean you briefly said there sometimes it's it's helpful or is this just it's helpful as long as you're serving a purpose as uh, long as your agenda yeah aligns with its agenda exactly it yeah 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 so like we, we tend to see this phenomena another mask of the phenomena would definitely appear within the scandinavian countries along with england and ireland and things like that northern europe within the fairy folk and you know yeah, i actually of, meant to i meant to actually take you down that path yeah. there, but thank you for reminding me yeah a lot of folks there they'll say are the fairies what are you talking oh no he's talking about fairies now but no there is a wealth of information within that mythology especially the way the interactions occur because the interactions are the same but today we get lost in this idea of the greys coming down and absolutely decimating cows on ranches across america and things like that but it happens here too you know we still have that going on in fact i have been on a farm where i seen the cattle that had been sliced and diced and which was near a fairy fort and you know, there's a remarkable books that were written by guys down in Dublin and tell a story of a farm up in Derry. And this farmer, you know, he has lost 500 head of his animals. 500 in 20 years. Jesus. It's phenomenal. And how that was covered up, because the guy took it to the, first of all, he needed to go to the vets and the animal and welfare this is there's nothing we can do with this and he went to the police because he was thinking maybe it was a neighbor that was slicing and dicing the cattle or the not the cattle the sheep and the police put up some cameras and they came back to him and says we're not dealing with this. and he then went to stormont which was the, the government in northern ireland they referred him to westminster in london who then referred him to brussels so they this know. This went all the way down the line to, to Brussels, to the EU, to the head of the EU to deal with, to, okay, I need this stopped because it's cost me a fortune. Brussels referred it back to the local police. We then arrived at his door and said, you're in charge of the animals. If we hear any more tales of animals being killed while under your watch, you will lose all your subsidies. In other words, he was silenced. Now that is happening today. Powers that be do know of things that are going on and why, but I'll not get into that. But getting back to the ferry, a hundred years ago, I'm aware of a story there in Leitrim in which a farmer had his new cow had delivered a calf and he put them into the barn beside the cottage. He came back out the next day and both the cow and the calf were sliced and diced. His big regret was that he didn't put iron on the door to protect them from the fairy. Not the grey aliens, the fairy. The fairy were doing this. Again, it's the same phenomena, different mask. And we see this going back further and further and further. So the fairy and themselves, yes, they have this thing that goes on. And I have photographs of this phenomena. They have stood on the hillsides and watched it as it appeared and took the photographs as it manifested and demanifested, they can be very, very troubling. And the fairy, are they exact same as the Middle Eastern jinn? 
They cross mm -hmm. over very neatly. Now, I, I, I came across a remarkable interview there on YouTube of two guys, Harold and I can't remember his second name, the other guy's name, Colt, let's say we'll call him Harold and Colt, who were driving down the road in Oregon and they turned a corner and Bigfoot was there. Bigfoot was 10 foot tall. Suddenly it dropped down, changed into this orange orb and shot off into the forest. And that's a phenomenon that would be, that would have that thrown out if it was 20 years ago. They said, no, that's absolute rubbish. No, we have to address these things. This phenomena is the same. It's the same source. We've got the orange lights that are being associated with the ferry 100 years ago. We've got huge cylinders, which are in the historical books from County Roscommon. They're noted as flying trains, ghost trains, because it's a huge carriage, what looked like a huge carriage in the sky with windows in the side full of white people. And it descended down into the lake, which there was a lot of smoke. Then it, it increased its height and went down and entered this particular ancient ring fort and was never seen again. We have stories of those particular lights attacking animals and things like that within the fields. Again, associated with the ferry and things like that. But the phenomena, it's always been there. It has always been there. It's from the same source, but we're interpreting it differently. You know, to speak to the Maori down in New Zealand and the Zulu and in South Africa and over to the folks in Peru and everything else, you know, we're all seeing the same thing, but we're just interpreting it differently. There are some occasions in which they do not want interaction with particular people. What we're seeing is that people who are born blind don't have an experience. People who are born deaf never have an experience. And people who have 2020 vision tend not to have an experience because those people tend to pull back details of phenomena at 20 feet that the phenomena does not want you to see. So again, that gives weight to the credence of challenge what's coming through, because if it's there for our betterment, it will not mind answering the questions for clarity. But if it's trying to conceal what it is or where it's coming from, then we should be seriously asking questions. Nine times out of 10, it's concealing. It really is. Now, how are people targeted for this stuff? Is it entirely location-based or is, can it sometimes kind of reach out and... You can be setting up a, a set of traffic lights. There's many times there's no reason for it and for it to latch on. You know, in the old days, we used to call it depression, but that's frowned upon now. And uh, there are now new terms, psychosis, you know, first term psychosis. Uh, blame the victim, basically. That's yeah, 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 yeah. It's, it's interesting that psychiatry now, especially within the, U, you know, the U.S., because we can see the numbers in the U.S. We can't see it in Europe. It's hard for us to get actual numbers of missing people, of all anything else. It's very, very difficult to get those numbers from Europe. But in America, we can get those numbers. We can see that within modern psychiatry, the rise of folks who are having first-term psychosis encounters is phenomenal. But here's the thing. The drugs are not fixing it. They're just muting it. There's muting it, yeah. Uh -huh. And I think that is a serious misjudgment. In my humble opinion, it's a serious misjudgment that we need to possibly put on the brakes a little bit and go back. Let's have a look at this oppression. Are there patterns with the oppression? Yes, there are. Where does oppression lead to? If it's untreated, yes, it can lead to possession. And again, that's a term that's not welcome these days. It's, it's real, though. Like, it's, like look, well, it's, yeah, I've interviewed yeah. people who've, who've been in rooms yeah. where things that they can't explain happen. Yeah. Yeah, right, absolutely. like languages, ancient, you know, like Aramaic, like mm -hmm. where the possessed would have no knowledge of or spoken. Mm -hmm. Just, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's real. It's rare, thank God, but it's real. Well, yeah, that that's the thing. You know, as I, as I said before, not everything that goes bump in the night is a ghost. Not everything, not every flashing light in the sky is a UFO. But we should be aware of being able to listen back to that instinct and judge the situation for ourselves not from anyone else, from ourselves, and go from there. Because the amount of people who have come to me that have been trying to reach phenomena in the sky with 
lasers or flashlights and things like that. And then before they know it, they have attracted something which is absolutely decimating their life. But how do I fix this? How do we fix this? Well, you should have known about this before you go into it, but they're not being taught that in today's society. Now it's all love and light. Well, that's BS whenever it changes. And, and nine times out of 10, it's going to change. You just got to give it its time. So th that can occur. And even, you know, I was reading a report there recently about meditation and about the side effects of meditation. And the people that are having serious side effects, 10% of the people that practice normal meditation um, are having serious side effects that can lead to up to a month or even for the rest of their lives, these particular encounters. And the encounters themselves, whenever I started reading through the details of what are these encounters, they fit neatly under repression. They're opening themselves up to the phenomena, seeing them. And this is a warning I was given whenever I was, you know, whenever I wrote the book, The Influence, when it looks at the biology of what the phenomena does to us, I was given that distinct warning, don't become too bright or they see you. And we've got folks that are coming in and going into meditation without understanding the threat that potentially you could attract something to you. And we're not being told, well, how do we fix that? And there are ways that it can be done, but it's long. And it's not a case of, well, you know, nowadays we've got a thing where the plumbing's wrong. You know, there's something wrong with the plumbing. Call the plumber. You know, we have to take ownership of this. Because there are many people, you know, they'll turn to their religion and their pastor or their priest will come in or their rabbi, whatever the case may be, will come in and try and rectify the situation. But when you've got a situation and a connection that the subject has and has established a symbiotic relationship with it, we can't break that. That's up to that person to break. Because as soon as we kick it out the door, seven days later, it's going to be back, if that. And the problem begins again because they have not broke that connection within themselves. They have to take responsibility for that. And it can be very, very difficult to break that because many times people do not want to break it. They want someone to fix it, but they don't want to break that connection. Yeah, because they get something from it. Yeah, exactly. Right? They get some yeah, benefit. It's a two-way street. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So is all meditation bad? Is it just transcendental meditation? Is it, is there, is, can meditation be beneficial in any way? Are certain people targeted and meditation <laughs> Medi just the yeah. path? Medication can be beneficial as long as you know what you're doing, you know, as long as you understand the threats behind it. It's like anything else, you know, fishing can be great, but if you fall in, you know, that can be problematic. There are dangers within everything, but meditation is, that's one of the silent ones that we were not told about. And it's something that really should be addressed. It's something that needs to be brought to the forefront to say, okay, folks, there is a side effect to this. Understand it and move along. And under that premise, then you can make that, what do they call it? Oh, I can't remember whenever you take, I can't remember the term for it, but then you can, as an adult, you can make that decision as to, well, is this a way I want to go or, or not? No, oh, discernment. In, informed consent. Oh, there we go. I see. There's one that's, that's being chopped around the past four years. Okay, I think we're probably roughly at time. So, any final words for the audience or warnings? More like <laughs> eat healthy and eat plenty of vegetables. <laughs> All right, thank you very much, my friend. You're very welcome. Always a pleasure. If you enjoyed today's video, please hit like and subscribe, and also hit the notification button so you can be notified whenever I post new content. Thank you. Now, if you're enjoying the channel and you want to support it, there are several things you can do. In fact, there are five things you can do. The first thing you can do is just buy my books. I got plenty of books out in the market right now, and I would prefer that folks buy a book rather than giving me direct support because they get something out of it. They have a real tangible product. The second way you can support me is by becoming a member on YouTube or becoming a patron on Patreon and just go to either site and it'll explain everything.
third way you can support the channel is by checking out my merch site, which is here. There's plenty of stuff that you could get to support the channel. And I'd appreciate that you, you have it and you can wear it. Not only do you help support the channel, but you also help promote the channel, and I appreciate that. The fourth way that you can support the channel, and this is really easy, is anytime you want to buy something on Amazon, literally just go to the description below and click on any link, literally any link. The channel gets a cut of that, and it costs you no extra money. You just go through the link as I'm part of the Amazon Affiliates Club. The fifth and final way you can support the channel is through donations. Now, I don't prefer these because it's more of a expression of gratitude, but you don't really get anything out of it as a subscriber to the channel. However, if you decide to do these options, there's two options. There's Buy Me A Coffee, which is a separate site. And there's also, you can go through YouTube with either a Super Chat, a Super Sticker, or a Super Thanks. Again, I prefer Buy Me A Coffee because that organization takes less money than Amazon does. But either way, I appreciate any support you, you are willing to give the channel. So thank you very much and keep watching. I really appreciate it.